started, everybody. Welcome to the uh, chart speaker series, and we're really pleased to have Dr. Julie Adams with us today. Uh, Julie is, I think, remarkably a self-trained person in uh, human factors and one of the best advocates that we have in human factors, but she actually has a master's and PhD degrees in computer and information sciences from the University of Pennsylvania and um, interestingly, a BS in computer science and in accounting from Siena College. Uh, she was the founder of the Human Machine Teaming Laboratory at Vanderbilt University, and she's there at the moment, I think graduating one of her former students, but then she since has moved on to Oregon State and works in the area of human machine teaming, and she's been doing that for 30 years now, and has focused on human interaction with unmanned systems and also on manned civilian and military aircraft at Honeywell and commercial consumer and industrial systems at Eastman Kodak Company. And so she's had a lot of rich experience and uh, lo really looking forward to hearing her talk on human collective teams, algorithms, transparency, and resilience. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so just one thing, I'm going to try and use my cursor if I'm trying to point to something. Um, so if you're not understanding what I'm looking at, please are talking about specifically on a slide, please let me know. Um, and so as Nancy indicated, I have a pretty broad experience. Um, yes, I did work for an account as an accountant for Allied Signal at one point in time. Um, but then I saw the light and went to grad school. Um, uh, but I am self-taught in human factors. Um, I like to say I'm a tertiary research personality. I work in robotics, artificial intelligence, and uh, more human factors than HCI. And what I want to talk about today is how do we deploy uh, these large-scale, simplistic agent collective teams in real-world environments. So the domains that I focus on tend to be uh, disaster response or first response. So uh, Veronica and I were talking a moment ago about tornadoes because I've been sitting right in Tornado Alley here. Um, uh, you know, so that kind of scenario or a military scenario. So these are complex domains. They're human-made domains that could be deconstructed, and um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty that it can occur. Um, during the course of these uh, situations. So we can't talk about everything that's necessary um, because it would take us all day um, to talk about everything necessary to deploy these teams. So we're gonna focus on three aspects that are kind of central to my research. Algorithms, um, the human factors and transparency, as well as resilience of these systems. Uh, maybe we will, hang on, there we go. Are my keys going to work? Yes, they are. So first, I want to ground us in some definitions. And I will use, be using mostly the term collective. And what I mean by that is uh, different types of systems of agents. And you frequently hear the term swarms um, to mean similar things to what I'm talking about. But in my work, um, and particularly, I collaborate a lot with Mike Goodrich at Brigham Young and Matthias Schotz at Tufts. Um, we use the term spatial swarm to mean uh, something like a biological species. Sorry, there are military aircraft going overhead. Um, a, a biological species such as schools of fish and flocks of birds. So these are simplistic individual entities that when they are in the group, they exhibit uh, intelligent behaviors. They are distributed systems and uh, often rely on implicit communication. They're not directly communicating with one another. As well, within these uh, biological species swarms, it's common that not all of the agents in the swarm understand what the current goal or objective is for the swarm and have complete knowledge of what's going on. In fact, often it's a small number of individuals that actually have uh, complete knowledge. Um, and that's related to this concept of leadership that we see in these species. And leaders are often individuals that have some information that is they're using to influence the, the swarm to achieve some objectives. So for example, if um, a subset of the fish know where there's a food source, they can influence the, the fish swarm to go to that food source, for example. We also talk about colony-based systems, so honeybees or ants. Um, and what is interesting about these systems is that they have um, often a nest or a hive. We call that the centralized hub in our work. Um, and this is a place where we know we can, we can have communication. Again, these are distributed agents. 
Um, there's localized communication, but there's more directed localized communication. So for example, honeybee waggle dance with uh, honeybees that are around the agent communicating. Additionally, these kinds of systems um, can embed communication into the environment by a concept called stigmergy. In our work, we do not consider stigmergy because we don't want to be uh, modifying the environment in order to enable our system. And that's because of the types of domains that we work in. Um, another aspect of these biological systems is that as the individual entities within the colony age, they transition between jobs and roles. Um, and so this adds a level of heterogeneity to the system um, that's a much larger level of heterogeneity than we see in spatial swarms. So in spatial swarms, we often think of them as being homogeneous, so be a particular species. But within that species, there is heterogeneity. So for example, adult fish versus the juveniles have different capabilities um, in certain species. So there's some level of heterogeneity within this homogeneous system, but there's a larger level of heterogeneity within uh, colonies. And when I talk about collectives, we're really talking about uh, trying to develop robotic systems that exhibit ca characteristics of both the spatial swarms and the colonies, perhaps being able to transition between the two in order to advance the capabilities of the overall system. Now, a lot of the work that's done on collective systems uses simulation. And these simulators are frequently what we call point-based simulators. They don't represent the dynamics and kinematics of the vehicles very accurately. They don't represent the physics of the environment. Um, so they aren't really these high fidelity uh, simulators. And in order to get that high fidelity, you often have to reduce down the numbers of agents, which can change the way the algorithms perform. So um, we wanted to have some capability in between these point-based systems and our outdoor systems. So our outdoor collectives, you know, they're very expensive, um, not only to purchase and maintain all those vehicles, but also to just be able to deploy them, especially if you're talking about large numbers of unmanned aerial vehicles. With Given today's uh, FAA regulations, you really are not able to fly that many vehicles without having a single person pilot to every vehicle. Um, in order to meet the regulations. So what you see here on the left-hand side is our collective test bed, and the platform is 15 by 13 feet, and the white panels are actually like puzzle pieces. They move around, and the orange um, squares here represent our hubs, and they also move around. So we can rearrange this. We can actually add more hubs if we want. Um, you get some perspective of how big the robots are, because these are robots on the platform here. Um, and in this system, we have 150 total agents. We have 50 Bit Craze Crazy Fly uh, UAS. This one this is actually one of them here. And then we have 100 ground robots. Um, they were originally based on the Georgia Tech Grits Boss, but we've redesigned them. Um, and we're in the process of uh, finally building out all 100 of those. Now, one of the things you don't see in this test bed is a visual camera-based uh, motion track tracking system or motion capture system. And that is intentional. We want to be able to take the capabilities that we're developing and put them on real robots in the real world. When you see the robots that I'm talking about, there's a lot of GPS error when you use those robots with GPS. You're also gonna have error from the sensors on the robots when you go into GPS denied environments. So motion capture, is an easy way for students to say, oh, we've got perfect information. Well, that's not what we want to work for. We want to work for, towards the hardest common denominator because we want to be able to transition things from this system into our real robots. So what we use for positioning of the vehicles is called local positioning system. It's developed by BitCraze for the Crazy Fly specifically. And for the Crazy Fly, excuse me, you can buy a board that allows you to basically position your vehicle. The LPS system, the local positioning system, is a DECA wave system, so it's very similar to GPS. It actually has slightly larger error um, in the positioning of the vehicles. Um, and then the limitation of that system as it was originally designed is that it wouldn't work with our ground robots. So we actually have developed our own board to be able to use the LPS system with our ground robots. However, BitCraze recently announced a board that was available for people to purchase. Our board is cheaper. So we, we're continuing to use our board. 
Um, and then I mentioned that, you know, we want to make this transition to outdoors because that's really our objective. So I am a co-PI on the Raytheon BBN integrator team for the DARPA offset program, along with our collaborators at Smart Information Flow Technology Systems. This program is now in, I think it's fifth year. Um, it's technically in its final year. And um, typically we do two field deployments every year. And our last field deployment was last August. We were scheduled to do one in January and that got canceled. And then our field exercise that was scheduled for July just got pushed back to October. Um, but this program will be ending later this year. And at the end of the program, we are supposed to be deploying a swarm of 250 vehicles in a three phase mission that lasts up to six hours across an eight block um, city area, or urban area. So we are talking about um, human built environments and typically the environments we're working in, we do this on military bases. Um, so the environments we work in have a mix of buildings from homes to barracks to um, you know, fire departments and post office and stores, as well as shopping plaza and um, multi-story office buildings or city buildings, things of that nature. Within the course of these deployments, we have to have our vehicles be able to um, basically do uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance of the entire area. We have to be able to identify uh, the differences between targets. And in this case, we're using April tags uh, to represent the information in the environment. And we have to perceive those April tags. And that was intentional by the program manager. He wanted us focusing on the algorithms and the actual um, deployment of the vehicles as opposed to the perception of things in the environment. And then we often have to do things in response to the information that we gather um, throughout the environment. So um, our prior deployment last August had four types of vehicles. I'm only showing one of the ground vehicles, but um, we use the ION R1 ground vehicle. We also use the R6, which is effectively the same vehicle, but with, oh no, there we go, with six wheels. Um, and you can see this kind of hat built on top of it. Um, so, you know, we have to put a number of sensors on these. We have to build these systems up. We don't necessarily just run ROS. Um, we run, um, we have an autopilot that is the same across all of our vehicles, but we do run components of ROS as well as uh, software that we develop uh, for the robots themselves. And that's true across all the vehicles I'm going to show you. Uh, throughout the entire program, we have used, yes, these are 3DR solos. Um, if you remember the solo, they were common about 10 years ago. And when the program started five years ago, we were able to buy about 200 of them for $200 a piece. Um, these vehicles have GPS and IMU and barometer on them, but they have no other sensors in the environment. They were intended to be hand flown, never to be flown autonomously. Um, we've added capabilities to them to allow them to be flown autonomously. We use a Raspberry Pi. Um, and we also have a uh, Pie cams on them uh, to get perceptual information from the environment. And then this is the Vifi EFO, which we in integrated in our last field exercise um, because the 3DR solo will not go indoors. It must maintain GPS in order to be able to fly. The EFO will allow us to fly indoors. Um, each of these vehicles, you know, we average about $5,000 per vehicle. So if you think about that multiplied by 250 plus some extra vehicles, plus additional sensors and processor boards, et cetera, et cetera, you know, you do start talking about a very large sum of money. For our final field exercise, uh, we are integrating, um, oh, I just forgot the name of this one. Shoot. Um, oh, I can't remember now. Sorry. We're integrating yet another um, uh quadcopter here. This quadcopter will also go in different environments. And then we have the Nano Talon that we've been trying to integrate. It's a small fixed wing, um, but we, we just talked yesterday afternoon about the fact that we're probably going to end up building our own um, small UAV because we've been having problems with this vehicle and uh, the company. So this particular vehicle is going to be used for persistent surveillance. So it'll be flying a pattern at altitude to provide persistent surveillance over the entire operational area. And then the final vehicle is actually a vehicle developed by Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. They're what we call a sprinter within the context of this program. And a sprinter is someone who received a smaller amount of funding to develop some specific capability. There have been five sprints over the course of the entire project focused on different things. Um, one of the sprints did focus on, for example, human interaction with the systems. 
This particular sprint focused on hardware. And so they took this acrobatic fixed wing vehicle and they're able to fly it around the building and capture information about the April tags on the building. It's actually really interesting to watch because it looks like it's gonna fall out of the sky. So uh, you can see here, we have a very heterogeneous team that we're gonna be deploying. And so that adds to the complexity. In addition to this, we have a single human operator. And that human operator is working with the planning system, the autonomy on the vehicles, as well as initiating uh, tactics or uh, plays for the vehicles to uh, execute. And they do this through a virtual reality interface. You can see here an image, uh, a high level image, uh, bird's eye view of Camp Shelby in Mississippi. This is where one of our deployments were. And you can see some of our vehicles here with the different uh, lines coming up with different colors to represent different things. So what do I mean by human collective teaming? Well, we want to be able to have hundreds and thousands of these cooperative robotic systems that are fairly simplistic to be able to go out into the real world environment and achieve tasks. Um, but we also have to have the capacity for them to team with the human and allow the human to influence the, the collective, um, perhaps have the collective make faster decisions or respond to different things that the human knows about. And so how do we address this um, when you've got autonomous decision making within your entities? And you do have to have very high levels of autonomy in these systems, because even in our case with um, you know, 250 agents or even 100 agents, the human is not going to be able to continuously process information from each individual agent, nor is the human going to be able to task each individual agent. So you have to think about the interaction and the autonomy differently than you would in a multi-robot system where there's fewer entities. Um, so there's a ton of things that go into actually deploying these systems from the hardware design and uh, your payloads, et cetera. I'm only gonna focus on things related to algorithms, um, the human interaction with the system and the transparency and resilient systems today. Oh, I did start my clock. Um, so first we're gonna talk a little bit about collective algorithms. Um, we've been working on bio-inspired collective algorithms for quite a while. One of the characteristics of these systems is that they have limited computational capabilities. Um, so yes, you might say that a Jetson processor is far better than the computer that I had on the robots in, in the early 1990s, and it is, in fact, much better, but it's still very limited when you start talking about some of the more uh, advanced autonomous algorithms or machine learning, you're not going to be able to do those things on these processors when these vehicles are deployed. Um, so you want to have these kind of lightweight distributed algorithms that allow the vehicles to coordinate and cooperate intelligently and achieve their mission. So over the course of the last decade or so, we've developed a number of different algorithms. Um, some of the ongoing efforts, um, we've recently been working, or not recently, for the last four years or so, we were working with the Honeybee Laboratory to study uh, self-removal drifting and guarding. And from those studies, we've been able to derive controllers for our robots, where our robots are able to exhibit those characteristics um, as part of the collective. Um, so we're really looking for how do we get scalable, robust, and flexible algorithms within our systems. We're going to focus on the best of end consensus decision-making algorithm throughout the rest of this talk. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this, around this time of year, uh, usually a subset of a colony of bees called the daughter colony will leave the main hive with one queen, and they will go out and they'll coalesce on a branch somewhere. And they have about five days to identify a location to establish a new hive. A subset of the bees, um, so typically there's 15 to 30,000 bees that leave the hive, um, and a subset of them, about 3%, are what we call scout bees. They're going out and they're searching within a range of this centralized location where all the bees are for di different crevasses where they may establish the hive. The scout bees um, have a really, really phenomenal what the bees are able to do to assess the utility or how good a particular site is. And I uh, point you to Tom Seeley's book called The Honeybee Democracy. It's an easy read, but it's super interesting to read about how the bees do this. Um, and so the bees go out, they search, they come back to the group, and they're interacting with the other scouts locally and trying to recruit those scouts to the location that they've been investigating. Over time, the scout bees will start to reach consensus as to what is the highest value site or the highest value sites. Um, what you want to avoid is what's called a split decision in which 
part of the group reaches consensus for one location and part of it reaches consensus for another and then they split the the bees up into two colonies only one colony is going to survive because only one colony is going to have the queen so you'd like to avoid that um, but once they reach consensus they get the rest of the bees excited and then they move them to that colony locate that new colony location to establish the colony so this is the concept biologically um, and to ground this for our conversation today, we can think of it this way. So our hub here in the central area, the light gray area, is, is where the agents are actually able to communicate or interact with one another, represented by the colors within the individual agents. The um, agents, when they're outside of the hub, we assume that they are unable to communicate. And the red agents in this instance are uncommitted. So they're doing a random walk throughout the environment. In our case, we assume that a radius of 500 meters around the hub is the area that's being searched for the highest for sites to be analyzed um, in this decision making process. In this case, we have two sites, A and B. Um, a is green, and so the green agents are favoring uh, site A, blue uh, agents are favoring site B. And ultimately, what they should be doing is selecting the highest value target. Now, if we assume that A is the highest value target, its distance from the hub is larger or longer, it's farther away from the hub than that of uh, site B. And so this brings us to uh, an issue that arises with honeybees and an issue that we want to be able to address in our algorithms, which is called environmental bias. So we want the colony to select the highest value target, um, our site, I'll probably use the word target because it's more natural to me. Um, but in environmental bias, what may happen is if A is the highest value target and B is not the highest value target, but it's closer to the hub, the colony may reach consensus on target B and select that target over A, even though A is the better target. And we call that environmental bias. Um, so that comes into play when we're developing algorithms. And when we started this work, developing this algorithm uh, a few years ago, Raina and colleagues had what was called the state-of-the-art algorithm at that time. I'll refer to it uh, in the rest of the slides as system sub R. And this particular algorithm was an individual best of end decision-making algorithm, meaning it would make a single decision. And the agents had to know where the targets were in the environment um, when they started looking for the highest value target. And so the algorithm is represented in four states effectively. You've got the uncommitted states at the top, both latent and interactive. And then you have um, variants of the favoring states where I here is representing the targets and, um, uh, sorry, lowercase i is representing the, the individual targets. And then you have the interactive and latent states and then you have probabilistic transitions. So there's three limitations to this algorithm. One, this algorithm um, cannot respond to dynamic events in the environment, which is really important if you're trying to talk about disaster response or military scenarios. It does not address environmental bias, which we'll see in some of the results that I'll present later. So it will often select a lower value target that is closer to the, to the hub. And this algorithm also takes a very long time in some cases to make a decision. And that is critical, especially in disaster response where you might need a faster decision. So my former student, Jason Cody, um, worked on developing an uh, instance of the best event algorithm that would address these three issues. And so in doing that, primarily what we're looking at in this uh, state diagram is addressing the issue of environmental bias. So he introduced the concept of interaction delays and interaction frequency modulation to try to ensure that, that those highest value targets that are far away from the hub are actually getting uh, represented, being represented within the hub and in the consensus decision-making process. Additionally, we wanted to be able to have a scenario in which um, we have the collective and they're going out and looking for the highest value target. And then we want them to move to that location and then start a whole brand new uh, search process. So they don't remember any of the prior targets and we want them to actually start the, start the search process again. So we call the sequential best of end decision-making. Um, in order to accommodate that, um, we had to come up with a state diagram that allowed us to represent the different states that they're in. And uh, both of these algorithms are algorithms that are um, counting-based best-of-end decision-making algorithms. 
as a result, the individual agents uh, maintain a queue of information that they gather by interacting with the agents around them. And they use the states of the agents that they're interacting with in order to make decisions about when they should transition. So there's two different ways that we looked at the queuing. One is a persistent queue. And the persistent queue says that it's maintaining all the information about all the interactions the bee has with other bees throughout an entire decision process from the time it starts until the agents have selected a, a site and are moving to that site. There's also episodic queues in which as the agent transitions through the different phases of the process, the queue is cleaned out and the new information is added during the next stage. So if you have deliberating robots, robots that are favoring a particular site, they're going to commit after they detect a quorum within their queue uh, for a particular uh, site by interacting with uh, committed agents or uh, detecting the quorum. When they're in the committed state, they can enter into that initiate state. That's where they're starting to communicate to the other bees that they're going to uh, move to a, a particular location. Um, so they do this after they detect a quorum or interacting with initiating robots. Once you have the quorum for initiating, then they move into the execution. And during the execution, uh, because we assume communications only occur within the hub, it is possible that there are agents that are outside of the hub when uh, the, the decision to select a particular site and move to that site is made, those agents outside of the hub will not know that. And so you'll end up losing some agents every time you make a sequential decision. So eventually you might lose all your agents, but we, we haven't gone to that many decisions. It'd take quite a few decisions to make that happen. Um, but you begin executing that move to the selected site and then once you've done that, you've finished that particular decision uh, set. And you forget about all the targets that you knew, and the agents begin a random walk throughout the environment, trying to identify the next site um, for the next decision problem. So in Jason's work, uh, from an algorithm perspective, he did a lot of experiments comparing his algorithm to Raina's algorithm and um, demonstrated that his algorithm really did address this environmental bias issue. Additionally, uh, we were able to speed up the consensus decision-making process compared to Raina's algorithm. Um, and then on top of that, we were able to enable these sequential uh, sequence decisions. Um, we did find with persistent cues that they were more reliable in a scenario where perhaps there were two targets of similar consensus amongst the agents that would potentially end up in a split decision um, and you wanted to avoid a split decision. Um, so that was good for the persistent queue. And with episodic queues, uh, we were able to get fast and accurate decisions with strong queue filtering. So from an algorithm perspective, we've got some really nice results, but there's some limitations still. Um, the consensus process still takes too long um, from the perspective of if we have a, uh, you know, a, a first response scenario, we want to be able to have the human say, okay, we've got enough information, let's just make the decision and take action. Um, but up until this point, there was really no work on humans could, how humans could influence colonies. Um, all the work had really been focused on spatial swarms. So that was one of the things that we wanted to look at as well. So as part of Jason's dissertation, um, we wanted to look at the human's ability to influence both of these algorithms. Uh, so Raina's algorithm system R and Cody's algorithm system C. And, and in doing so, we also did not want to use the traditional swarms-based interface. So traditional swarms-based visualization will show every single agent. And we had already demonstrated using biological data how humans perceive um, multiple objects based on biological fish data as part of a psychological study um, for multi-object tracking. So we wanted to look at an abstract visualization. So we created this visualization where the Roman numeral rectangles, and I'm only showing one here, represents the hub. Um, and within that, we have a representation of our states of the decision process. So we have uncommitted U favoring F, committed C, and X is executing. We use the um, level of opaqueness of the value to represent how many agents are in that state. So currently the majority of agents in this hub are in the executing state. Um, and in this case, 
they've actually uh, started the movement of the hub to the target. So we have four targets here, four, five, six, and seven. Um, and you can see the, sorry, my mouse got stuck. This is a representing that the target is, or that, sorry, the hub is moving to this target and the green outline represents the target that it's moving to. The more salient green here represents that this target is a higher value target as compared to target five. And the blue here represents uh, the percentage of agents that are favoring this target. Um, it's also possible in, in our case, we have four separate hubs of 200 agents each. So it's possible that multiple hubs could be investigating this particular target here, for example. Um, so I mentioned that we have four hubs. We have four hubs with 200 uh, scout agents. They do a random walk when they begin the process, and then um, they are communicating within the hub and go through the entire decision-making process. Throughout the evaluation, participants were uh, required to interact um, and supervise all four hubs. Um, and each hub had to make at least two decisions. So at least eight decisions were made um, across each participant. The participants had three commands that they could um, initiate on a, a colony. So they could select a target and a hub and uh, indicate that that target should be investigated by that particular hub. When that occurred, 5% of the agents were allocated to go investigate that particular target and assess its value. They could also abandon a target. So uh, for example, here with number five, it looks like it's a pretty low value target. We might wanna speed up the process by saying, stop investigating that target. Um, actually a better example here might be six because it has a pretty good value. And so we would select the hub, we'd select the target and we'd say abandon. You can undo an abandon command and that will be important in some later results. And then there's also a decide command. So once 50% uh, of the agents are faving a particular target, um, the human can say, make the decision. Don't wait for uh, the 75% of agents, which is our threshold in our algorithm, to make the decision autonomously. In this case, um, we had both Raina's algorithm, system R, and Cody's algorithm, system C, but we also had one where the human was using those three commands to make all of the decisions. The agents made no decisions. They just executed going and gathering the information for the human. Um, so the human didn't know the value, for example, and had to get that information from the agents. Um, we had two decision difficulties. So we had easy decisions where the highest value target is close to the hub, and we had hard decisions where the highest value target is more than 350 meters from the hub. And like I said before, the maximum distance that they searched was 500 meters. Follow-on student, uh, Karina Roundtree, is a human factor student. So she was interested in a couple of other factors here. We wanted to look at the influence of visualizations on how humans interacted with colonies. And we also wanted to look at the concept of transparency for collectives. So uh, in her study, we have uh, the individual agents interface, which you see here in the lower right. And the hub is in a similar location to what you saw in the last uh, slide, but we aren't representing any information about the state of the collective in making the decision. The state of the collective is actually embedded into the individual agents. And so you can see here, sorry, my mouse keeps getting stuck. Um, you can see here green agents. So these green agents represent that the agents are favoring this target 15. Just like on the prior slide, the value of the target is embedded into the color of the, the brightness of the green of the target. The yellow agents are uncommitted. So they're doing a random walk. And then when you see the video, you'll see that when agents are committed and executing, they turn cyan, and I'll show you that in a moment. She also had 28 participants, and uh, we did not include Raina's algorithm in this uh, particular evaluation um, because we had demonstrated that uh, Cody's algorithm was better, and she also had the human-driven. We had the same commands, and we had the same easy and hard decisions. We had four hubs with 200 agents and at least two decisions per hub. So I'm gonna play a little bit of these videos for you simultaneously. These are two different participants at similar points in their uh, session. This is after targets have been identified. Um, so you see the collective uh, interface, the abstract interface on the left, the individual agents interface on the right. You can see here the cyan agents that I was talking about um, making the transition to this target for the hub. 
And then, oh, come on, it should be going already. Um, we're pretty soon gonna see that this hub selects this target and it moves. Um, you can also see here that this target has been abandoned uh, with the red outline. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the uh, abandoned target is the only one that can be, only command that can be uh, canceled. And then um, you have these pop-up boxes. So these are showing for the hubs in the uh, system, how many agents or what percentage agents from each hub are, are investigating that target. So that allows you to see if there's multiple um, hubs investigating the same target. So I wanna talk a little bit about transparency and what that is. Um, this was a concept developed by Jesse Chen and colleagues at the Army Research Lab. And the idea is how does an agent communicate um, or provide information to the human with regard to the, the agent's state, its process, and uh, what's happening in that remote environment. So in this case, we are assuming remote supervision of the, of the system. And as part of their work, they define the situation awareness agent transparency framework that leverages um, the trust calibration um, three Ps. It leverages situation awareness model from Ensley, as well as belief, desires, and intentions framework. And if you look at the three levels within uh, the, the transparency framework, you see that they're similar to situation awareness uh, levels um, from Ensley's model. But what's missing here is we aren't really talking about the human, we're talking about the agent. And we're talking about the agent's ability to communicate its information to the human in a way that allows the human to have better understanding of what's going on with the agent. So at the lowest level, we're talking about the agent being able to communicate its current status, what its actions it's taking in the environment and what it's perceiving about that environment. At level two, we're trying to provide some understanding of the agent's reasoning processes, what its potential constraints are, so that the human has a better understanding of why the agent might be taking that particular action. Um, while this sounds similar to explainable AI, it's not exactly the same thing in the way that Chen and company define it. Um, and then at level three, similar to the SA uh, framework, we're talking about future aspects in the near term for the agent. So what does the agent expect its outcomes to be in the near term? What limitations does it expect it's going to encounter that may impact its ability to do what it had planned to do? Um, so this is really interesting work. And originally Chen defined this and her, her colleagues defined this for single agent um, scenarios and then extended it to multi-robot scenarios. Karina was really interested in how do we extend this to collectives? Um, and so she spent um, quite a work amount of time developing a framework of transparency for collectives that leverages the work Chen has done, but really looks at the broader factors of these more complex systems and the direct and indirect factors that influence transparency in collectives. As part of that, um, she wanted to understand the transparency of, from the two evaluations that I mentioned. And so the first analysis that she did stri looked strictly at the visualizations. So she used the results from Jason's evaluation and her evaluation for uh, the CODI algorithm. And she looked across both visualizations as well as all decision difficulties. In the course of this work, she defined four research problems and eight hypotheses. We're not talking about all of those today, don't worry. We're only gonna talk about two. Um, and so one of them is related to usability. And uh, that hypothesis says that the collective visualization will promote better usability. Um, and then the second one is related to the team's performance and that the collective team, uh, collective visualization will promote uh, the team's performance. In the course of this work, she also had to define metrics for transparency and for collectives because not all of the metrics that we commonly use are applicable. Um, so she defined over 28 different metrics for the different research questions. Again, don't worry, we're not looking at all of them. We're only looking at two. Um, and I will define these in a moment. So. For the usability question, uh, we wanted to look at the number of times the operators abandoned the highest value target. This implies that we might see poorer performance um, and that the visualization is not supporting usability if the human is unable to understand which target has the highest value. Um, this is calculated by taking the number of highest value targets that are abandoned and dividing that by the total number of abandoned targets. So what we see here for the collective interface 
is that there's actually a slightly higher number of the highest value targets being abandoned by the operators. Um, but for the individual agents interface, that there's no significant difference here, but it was less. Um, this does not support our hypothesis that our visual collective visualization will promote better usability within the context of this particular metric. Um, you know, I'm only scratching the surface here. I refer you to our uh, journal papers that are coming out soon. Um, when we look at performance, we wanted to look at where was the uh, hub able to select the highest value target um, the majority of time. So we call this the selection su success rate. So it's the percentage of correct decisions. And when we look at this result, we find that the collective interface actually resulted in a higher selection success rate, meaning that the collective more frequently selected the highest value target. Um, and this is particularly interesting for the hard decisions, since you see that there's a pretty uh, substantial difference between easy targets and hard targets. Um, there is significant difference between the visualizations for this result, and the individual interface uh, resulted in substantially lower uh, success, selection success rate. So we do support our hypothesis here that the collective visualization um, resulted in a better performance for the team. However, um, it's interesting because if we are, have the same visualization resulting in the larger percentage of the highest value targets being abandoned, we shouldn't be seeing a higher selection success rate um, for that same visualization. So the, the takeaway here is that the, collect, the collective operators had to be using that cancel assignment mechanism to undo the abandonment of highest value targets um, that would have resulted in negative influence on the collective. But what we don't know from this particular analysis is how the operator's interactions impacted this finding. Um, and this is an aspect of trying to understand all the intricacies of transparency. So that led to um, the second analysis that really looks more at the models with the visualization analysis, creating a, a much more complex analysis um, than, than is often seen. And here, what we're looking at is we're adding in the human-driven uh, model with the Cody algorithm with our results. So um, again, we had four research questions and eight hypotheses. We're going to focus on similar uh, research questions and hypotheses to the prior study, except we're adding in that the Cody uh, algorithm with the collective visualization will result in better usability and better team performance. So if we look at the highest value target uh, abandoned percentage again from a usability perspective, um, we find with the human-driven model, so this is the case where the human is telling the collective to investigate targets, it's telling it to not investigate targets, it's telling to make a decision once it's reached 50% of the agents favoring a target. We see, see that we still have fewer um, of the highest value targets being abandoned with the individual agents visualization and the human driven model, so over here. Um, but we also see a substantially lower value for the collective interface. Some respects, this isn't all that surprising because the human is really driving the process as compared to the algorithm. Um, so we don't support our hypothesis that this combination here would result in the lowest number of uh, highest value targets being abandoned and improved usability. Now, when we look at this from a performance perspective, we see very little difference in the human-driven model for the individual agents as compared to the system model. Um, so it's virtually identical. Um, we do see an improvement, especially um, across the, actually across the board here, um, but especially for the hard targets, um, there's a substantial increase um, in the human-driven model. Again, the humans are driving the process, so not all that surprising given how the algorithm works, but we get a good result. And so we do partially support our hypothesis that the combination of the collective interface with the, the system uh, Cody algorithm uh, performs better. But what we don't see is what we saw before, which was this high selection success rate with the highest uh, high, uh, percentage of high value targets being abandoned. Um, we still see uh, a much lower number of targets being abandoned with that uh, particular visualization, but a high success rate. So this particular analysis 
you know, didn't find that the undue actions were uh, necessary to influence the collective's task performance. Um, and the, really the important takeaway here is that if we want to understand transparency, we have to do more complicated analyses of our results um, than often is done. And so that also requires us to identify appropriate um, means of quantifying transparency objectively. Now, I will say that uh, we would have liked to use eye tracking in these experiments. We didn't have that capacity at the time. It's something that we're integrating now. And we do think that that would um, allow us to more generalize some of our objective metrics that we developed for transparency um, related to um, identifying where the humans were interacting and, and looking at the time that different things transpired. Um, the other important takeaway here is that undesirable behaviors from poor transparency may not actually negatively impact the team or the decision-making process. Um, so that is an, an important aspect when you start talking about these very complex systems, because the human is not always going to have a perfect understanding of these systems. And especially when you talk about going out into the real world, you almost never have perfect communications with the agents. Um, and frequently they are not in communication. So um, you're going to have these scenarios where you're not going to be able to fully understand what's going on. But that leads us to the next topic, which is how do we ensure that these systems are actually able to function better in these real world environments? And that brings us to resilience. Um, so I want to first talk about biological agents and their resiliency. So we look at biological agents and they are really great at resisting uh, the impact of a disturbance, um, trying to uh, absorb that disturbance and recover from it. They also can learn from different disturbances that they haven't seen previously and improve their performance in response to that disturbance when they encounter it in the future. Um, so we want to build these capabilities into our collective because the more resilient the collective is, the better it will be able to respond to things that we cannot anticipate in these uncertain environments. And that will also improve the overall team performance and reduce the demands on the human. There are two common definitions of resilience in the literature. Um, that we've focused on. So there's engineering resilience and engineering resilience says you have this engineered system and you have this uh, target performance level that you want your system to maintain. You want it to be a continuous representation of the system. And what happens when a disturbance occurs is that your performance drops and you want to reduce that drop, but you also want to reduce the amount of time that it takes to recover back to your target performance. In ecological resilience, you have a system that has a certain set of dynamics to it, and there is a threshold above which if you change something in that system, your dynamics are going to change, and you're going to be able to either um, un be unable to recover from it, or it's going to be catastrophic enough that it will take a long time to recover from it. The example I like to use is a levy system, where the levy gets a break, um, and you have to it completely change the system dynamics of the levy. In both of these cases, uh, a lot of the results are post hoc analyses and they're qualitative metrics. So we're having to not only define what does resilience mean for autonomous systems, we're having to identify uh, the types of perturbations that occur as well as the metrics that can be used to assess resilience in real time objectively so that the system can respond. As part of this work, we have um, defined uh, classes of perturbations. So the first perturbation type is an addition. So it may be that we add a new sensor to our robot, or we add, we, we bring two, uh, a group of, two groups of uh, robots together, and when they come together, they now have a new capability that they couldn't do as independent collectives, um, something of that nature, or information is added in the environment. So perhaps we thought that a building had been destroyed by a tornado, but in fact, we get there and it's not. Um, so this is uh, an example of, I'm sorry, I should have done the opposite for that example. We assumed that the building was not destroyed and we get there and we find out the building is destroyed. So that's added information that would be a perturbation. With an ablation, we're losing information. So uh, we have a sensor capability that dies. The sensor just dies or our manipulator dies or even a vehicle dies that has an important contribution to the collective. Um, it could also be that something changes in the environment. So that building that um, we had assumed was standing and was standing at the beginning, uh, just after the tornado occurred, you know, and we started our response. Well, now that building uh, collapses. 
So that what we knew about that building and the information we had about it, and perhaps we were going to use it as a staging area, um, that's now gone. And so that changes the way we uh, have to respond. And then the distortion, this is a case where, for example, and this is common with sensors. Um, we have a beautiful, bright, sunny day here, a bluebird day in Nashville. And if we were to take a number of the cameras that are commonly used on robots um, that are not necessarily designed for UV light outside today, you probably would not get very good performance out of them. Um, so the images would be distorted and the sensor processing would not be all that great. And so that's a good example of a distortion. And then a shift is a combination of these different types of perturbations. It's more complex. We're going back to our best event example here for uh, looking at ablation. And um, in the case of ablation, you have your hub in the center represented by the quad rotor. And we have three targets here, 90, 80, and 85. At some point during the best event consensus decision-making process, we're going to ablate or remove this target 90, which is our highest value target and the target that we should be expecting the collective to choose. When that occurs, what we want to see is that the collective is actually going to select the second highest value target, in this case, 85. So um, we have a paper coming out next month in the DARS conference uh, on some experiments related to this. Um, that paper covers both an ad uh, perturbation as well as the ablation perturbation or the remove site. I'm only going to talk about the ablation today due to time. But um, in our experiments, we've looked at collectives from 50 to 500 agents. We have four, four sites that we are considering. The sites are located in different configurations um, of values at 3, 6, 9, and 12 o'clock. So the, the sites are specifically located at 3, 6, sorry, noon, 3, 6, and 9. But we rotate or change um, not only the distance of the targets from the hub, but also where the values, what values those targets are. So we used uh, four values, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Of course, 90 being the one that you would expect to choose in the highest, um, in the non-perturbation state. In the case of the ablation, we're removing that target, that 90 target at some point during the decision-making process. And therefore the collective should be selecting the target with a value of 80. I mentioned previously that we assume you have to have 75% of the agents uh, choosing a target in order to make that choice and move to that target. So we want to look at early disturbance of so 15%, about halfway through that consensus decision-making process, or 35%, and then later in that process. And we're going to look at selection accuracy again. So the paper specifically focuses on results with Raina's algorithm. And if you recall, I said that that algorithm does not address uh, environmental bias. And so this chart is very busy, um, but we are representing um, easy and difficult decisions as well as intermediate decisions. So the difficult decisions were those that were beyond the, the highest value target was beyond 350 meters. And the easy decisions, the target was uh, between, uh, was at 200 or less meters from the hub and the intermediates in between. So we're representing that by the, the lines. So solid line is easy. Uh, dash dot is difficult. Um, and then we have a baseline here in which we are not ablating any targets. So we have all four targets. We expect the algorithm to select uh, 90. And for the different configurations, we do 50 trials of each. So we see here that Raina's algorithm with no disturbances is very good for the easy targets. It's OK with the larger number of uh, agents in the collective along the x-axis here. Um, so when we have 50 agents, we don't have very good selection accuracy, but as we increase the number of agents, we get better. And for the difficult decisions, we do see that environmental bias where the selection accuracy is very low. It's selecting, not selecting the highest value target. What's interesting in these results, especially for the intermediate and, decision, and difficult decisions, is that we would expect um, that if we introduce the disturbance, we ablate that highest value target at 15% early in the decision-making process, that the algorithm should be able to recover. And we don't see that uh, at all in, in the cases of these uh, two decisions. Um, it's a little bit better for the easy decision, but it still underperforms compared to the late decisions. Um, some of that's the characteristics of the algorithm and how it's committed to a particular target. Now, if we look at Cody's algorithm, which was specifically designed to address this environmental bias aspect, you can see for the black lines, which are our baseline, we're not ablating any targets, we get pretty good results um, 
across all the different decision difficulties across the number of agents uh, for the selection accuracy. More importantly, when we look at the early and mid disturbance timings, we get very good results irrespective of the problem difficulty. Um, so our selection accuracies are staying quite high. Um, we are seeing some differences in the number of agents, but once you get to about 200 agents, there's not a lot of difference here. Um, what we weren't expecting necessarily was that the late disturbances would be unrecoverable. Uh, we were pretty optimistic in our hypothesis that um, if we introduce this at least at 60%, the pink or the pink line here, that we would be able to recover and at least get a, a, a selection accuracy that'd be more along the lines here where I'm drawing with my uh, cursor. So what we can take away from this is that we do have uh, the ability within this algorithm for ablation to recover um, from early disturbances, but we also have to look at how we develop adaptive capabilities. So what has happened is that the, the collective has gained enough momentum towards that 90 target and then we ablate it and it's gone away and they're unable to change that decision process late in the, late in the consensus. Um, one of our open problems is continuing to tr try to figure out how to create a general model of the factors that determine the effect of disturbances on the feedback loops within the collective and doing that automatically. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, just trying to tie things back together again, you know, we started talking about the best event algorithm and how that can have an influence on the collective's behaviors. Then we talked about how do we assess transparency and how do we allow the human to influence that algorithm and influence the collective's decision-making process that gets us partway there. But really to deploy these systems in real world environments, we have to also have this aspect of resiliency because the human can't be interacting with all these individual agents. It's just not feasible from a human factors perspective. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the three primary students um, the two former students, uh, Jason and Karina, as well as my current student, Jennifer, who's been working on the resiliency, all my external collaborators, my current collaborators and prior collaborators, and of course our funding agencies. And I'll be happy to take questions.